Yes. Thank you very much, Alex, and thank you to everyone who decided to come to this talk. Uh, as I've said earlier, it took some time for the presentation to download. There are a lot of photos and pictures, so if there isn't any substance in my talk, at least you will enjoy some uh, photographs. Anyway, when Alex asked me to talk about the universal child, I thought, oh, I know quite a lot of things. And I was very excited because I was also interested. But starting to put together the presentation, this is where the challenge starts. Because this is the time when I found the gaps in my knowledge, my biases, my prejudice, my preferences. So it wasn't so easy. Anyway. I put this presentation here trying to uh, two, two things. One, to discuss the image of the universal child as it may be portrayed in international and national policies and reinforced further through a literary interpretation of policies and their application. The second purpose of this talk is to challenge the image of the universal child through pedagogical praxis, underpinned by the ethical dimensions of justice and fairness. Okay, the second, I left it slightly open because I want to be the part of the discussion. The first one, I think I've got some evidence. And uh, so, oh. What has happened here? I think I need help. Oh, it's all right. Okay. Okay. I will address the issue of the universal child through different frameworks. This is the rights, the child rights framework, and the economic uh, framework two arguments about child provision, the, the rights of the child and the economic argument. Also, I will use evidence from neuroscience very briefly, and I will refer to Aristotelian ethics for a pedagogy of equity, and this is where the issue of justice and fairness comes in. So, the structure of talk is a brief historical overview ECEC stands for Early Childhood Care and Education. And epistemological influences, the rights of the child and the socioeconomic arguments and influence on policy, the universal image of the child conveyed in policy and practice, and the final one is pedagogy, pedagogical praxis, it should be not pedagogy, for equity a fine balancing act of justice and fairness for each and every child. I use the word praxis, not practice, because in, it's a Greek word and there is a differentiation between the two. Practice is the application of something which we know skills at the moment. Praxis is a process. So it's, it has wider implications and meaning. Okay, historical overview, very, very briefly. Uh, for a long time, we had this division between care and education. And care was offered mainly to children who were poor and disadvantaged and parents or especially mothers entered the labor market. And very recently, a publication, an edited volume came out where there is a quite a, a detailed overview of care starting in ex-Soviet <coughs> Union when women entered the uh, labor market and then expanded in countries like China and so on. But also, perhaps that was the case in my own country, in Greece, care was offered mainly to parents who were at work and had a certain income or below a certain income so they couldn't afford private care. 
Education, on the, on the other hand, I can't say that it figured highly for a long time. It was mainly voluntary provision in the UK, as far as I know, play groups flourished, and it was very much play-based, and it was for the few and privileged. Mothers who didn't work, they organized themselves, they had uh, play groups and so on. Or, and the influences was mainly the child, uh, the influences were from developmental psychology and the child development in particular. And the child was conceived as the normative child, ages and stages. We know very much and very well Piaget's theory. And it has been influential as well in practice because we know about developmentally appropriate practice. We all know about Bretticom's uh, uh, publication late 80s. And actually it has become the golden yard in early years provision, uh, uh, developmentally appropriate practice. Now, criticism came from different areas like Canella, Moss, Peter Moss and so on. They, they've said, well, we look here at the child, the biological child, the universal child, that, that this child exists independently of context. So, and still this criticism exists. Aside from this, however, in terms of discipline influences, within the field of uh, psychology, we had different influences from Bronfebrenner and Vygotsky. Bronfebrenner, in the 1979, published the seminal work, The Ecology of the Child. In the early 1980s, Vygotsky's work started to be published in English, and it was mainly the Americans who were very much taken by his work and his ideas. For them, it was quite new and quite uh, appealing. It's quite interesting that both Bronfebrenner and uh, Vygotsky, they were, uh, Bronfebrenner lived in the uh, ex-Soviet Union, but he moved to the, uh, to the States, whereas Vygotsky was a contemporary, actually, of uh, Piaget, but he died quite young, and his work wasn't really very much disseminated, at least in English. And, um, it's interesting, Vygotsky and Piaget, they were in contact, but they differentiated their views. So Bronfebrenner, Bronfebrenner and Vygotsky focused very much on the context of the child. So the child is there, but the child is just part of different layers and different systems. So you may have heard as students about the micro and macro system in Brofebrenner's theory and how the influences and the dynamic interactions within different systems at the different levels impact on the child. So the child within the family, the child within the early year settings, the child within the uh, welfare, but also the interactions between family, early year settings, early year settings and welfare, uh, health services and so on. But also the outer layer is the policy, is the state, the attitudes and values which are portrayed in policies. Vygotsky, on the other hand, focused in similar ways on the context and he focused very much on the socio-cultural influences, how adults and ch uh, children, how the knowledgeable others uh, impact on children. They looked at the child with the potential, what the child can do now, and what the child can do with help from someone knowledgeable. He focused very much on the role of language. So language and thought, it was part of his debate, I suppose, with uh, Piaget uh, as well. And language for him, it was a cultural tool. And I can understand this very well as being a non-native English speaker person. Because language is a tool which evolves over time within a particular culture and, there are con and conveys 
concepts and ideas which sometimes it's very difficult to translate in another language. So in English, there are terms which still I can't use them because they don't, I can understand now the, the underlying meaning, but still I can't use it because it's not part of my uh, frame of thinking. The same way is in English, I mean uh, in Greek. I mean, a good example actually is pedagogy, it's a Greek word, and how has been interpreted and defined in English, it's not what is the meaning in Greek. So, because we don't, the, the words have conceptual underpinning, and this conceptual underpinning, it's part of our culture, how we think, how we develop over time. So, these were quite interesting and very inspiring contribution from the field of psychology which dominated early childhood. However, it didn't appeal to policymakers. I remember a few years ago, Professor Bernard Spodek, uh, an eminent American early childhood pro professor, he had a presentation in a conference, ESERA conference, and he talked about different uh, fields of psychology contributing to early childhood. He didn't mention the theory, uh, the ecological the theory, Bronfebrenner's theory. So Margaret Carr from New Zealand had a question. She said, but you left it out, why? He said, exactly this. It doesn't sit very comfortably with policy makers. They are not interested because it brings in a lot of variables which they cannot control. Where the child development, the ages and stages, it's very clear cut now. And we'll see how it has influenced a whole industry of assessment later on. So that was, I would say, the field more or less up to 1970s and before the United Nations Convention of the Rights of the Child. The field uh, started to change in the 1970s as part of the discussions for the rights of the child and definitely it has changed after the introduction of uh, the rights of the child, the Convention of the Rights of the Child. Why, that was actually a landmark in the field because it was the rights of the child <clears throat> emphasize very much the, uh, the right which the children have to education, to care and protection and participation. But also it acknowledges the role of the family or the primary caregivers to observe children's rights. It's not just the child has rights. The convention actually places responsibility on family. But ultimately, is the state which has the overall responsibility to provide support for families and parents to ensure that the children's rights are fulfilled. So what did happen? Many countries initially signed the Convention of the Rights of the Child, CRC, as is uh, known now, and uh, consequently ratified it. And now, all countries but one have ratified the Conventions of the Rights of the Child. And the country which hasn't ratified it is the United States of America. The other one which didn't ratify it until last year, it was Sudan but now they have done so. Of course, ratifying, signing the convention is one thing and implementing and observing the rights of the child is completely different. So, as part of this, the countries being signatories, having signed the convention of the rights, they created some kind of obligations for themselves. They started to introduce policies. But still, early childhood care and development and education, I use development as well because there are so many terms, it was something which it was questionable. Why? 
governments should spend money for young children. That was parental responsibility. They wanted the evidence. So that uh, saw the rise of many evaluation studies which demonstrated that having children in early childhood care and education settings, providing for this, the children have better educational out outcomes, better socio-emotional development, savings in expensive intervention and judicial costs, other productivity and contribution to society, women's employment and productivity, and greater returns of investment in early childhood care and development. What is quite interesting, these messages have been taken into account and been quantified. I don't know whether it's clear, actually. Uh, without a high quality early education at risk children are, and it gives, this is something which is published in the White uh, House website. They use this evidence for advocacy for early childhood care and education. And also, what is quite interesting is that uh, if you have better uh, early childhood care and education, ECEC I will refer from now on, at birth, from birth, then it's more likely the children to go to pre-primary or primary education. They do better in primary education. They follow and they go to secondary education, tertiary education. They uh, get to jobs, uh, better jobs, better uh, salaries. They pay more taxes. Uh, a lot uh, of uh, antisocial behavior is reduced, so we don't have to pay for expensive interventions. Special education needs are identified and so on. Here is a, but, oh, I don't know whether it's clear or not. Accrued benefits of uh, ECEC, so for children, but also in their adulthood. Benefits for education, health and welfare, but also economy. So what is quite interesting is gradually ECEC attracted the interest of economists. And they went back and looked at some programs and calculated the returns of investment in CEC. And the economist Heckman, for example, was the first one who did so, and he looked at the range of programs, mainly in uh, the States. And uh, he concluded that if we spend one dollar, the returns are up to $17.7. .7. Also, it's eight times more returns if we invest in early childhood than investing later in primary school where the returns are three to one. So, of course, a big criticism was all this data comes from high resource countries, from the States and Western North Europe. What does it say about low and middle income countries? In uh, the period 2007 to 2011, a range of uh, papers were published in the Lancet. So a group of academics uh, reviewed a range of programs which were implemented in low and uh, middle income countries or low resource countries and they included only programs which they were uh, planned quite systematically. They were not evaluated, but at least planned systematically, and they gathered some data. And they concluded actually that the returns in these countries are also between 6.4 to 17.6%. And also, if we increase uh, ECC provision from 25% to 45%, then this contributes to 30%, up to 70% in, uh, 
and the Millennium Development, uh, Development uh, Goals. And we'll talk about this later, what the Millennium Development Goals are. So ECEC was seen very important as an economic good. So the discourse actually started slightly to move from early childhood as a right, from child development to human development and to economic arguments. So here is very well known graph. This is from Heckman's work. And he argued that we can invest early to close disparities and prevent the achievement gap, or we can pay to remediate disparities when they're harder and more expensive to close. So for advocacy in early years, investing early is a good investment. That at least something which is held across the low and middle income countries. However, I will go back here. All these are good. It does make contribution to children's education, health, and also for adulthood. But quality is a key issue here. All depends on quality, duration of services, frequency of attendance, and better out outcomes for the youngest children and the most vulnerable and disadvantaged. So all the evidence from early childhood programs has been taken now by policymakers, and it has become actually a political instrument to alleviate poverty. And there are some colleagues who are doing some research here about this uh, issue, which is all good, but also we've taken an instrumental view of the child. And this is something which, for which we need to reflect, because children are also <coughs> citizens of today. They are not the adults of tomorrow, the productive adults of tomorrow. So early childhood is as good and as important to alleviate poverty as long as it is part of a comprehensive agenda on its own can solve poverty. But children also have the right to not experience poverty now, not only to better their lives for, for the future. So these are some issues which really uh, need to reflect and think and how we see the children. And actually, the economic argument is, is contrasting the argument, the, the rights of the child argument, which is about the child being here and now. His or her being is important as well as becoming. So that's the evidence from program evaluation of early childhood of ECCD programs evaluation. But we've also got further evidence from neuroscience. And that's something which everyone cites now. And there is a graph here which is not clear, I think. Or at least I can't see whether it's clear or not. But uh, what it does demonstrate is that children who experience toxic stress, disadvantage, poverty, and all what comes with poverty, because poverty itself, it's not the, the problem, is what comes with poverty. When uh, you don't have money, you don't have work, you have a lot of time with your child, but you are so preoccupied with worries about money, uh, being on your own, isolated and so on, distress, violence in the families and so on. So children who are exposed to these uh, conditions, the synapses are weaker than children who have a better stimulating environment. So the neuroscience actually has confirmed that lack of stimulation, persistent stress, and multiple risk factors, especially in low and middle income countries, 
okay? where there are additional issues like malaria, diarrhea, and so on, malnutrition, undermine children's development. So they have underdeveloped neuro, uh, neural connections, and that affects their cognitive functioning and has lifelong consequences. But also there is another part of science, the epigenetics. And it's quite interesting. I was talking to a colleague who is uh, in uh, Tanzania, who is a human rights uh, advisor. He is doing some research and he argues on the basis of neuroscience, but I think it links more with epigenetics, that the chronic malnutrition over generations has impacted the cognitive functioning of children over generations. And this is something which epigenetics actually uh, emphasize. How the environment, it doesn't only affect the individual, individual's lifespan, but how alters the DNA, our uh, genetic endow uh, endowment to affect other generations. And on this point, I was reading recently in, in The Guardian an article about uh, the trauma which uh, people experienced during Holocaust has altered specific parts of the DNA. So it's quite interesting uh, how early stimulation or lack of early stimulation of a positive environment impacts on the child, but also it has long-term, lifelong con uh, uh, term con uh, consequences. So, what does the research tell us? Early experience determines children's development and learning. The earlier the children are exposed to rich learning experiences, the better their development and learning, and in turn, this affects their uh, cognitive functioning and function in general in society, but all quality, duration, frequency, are critical factors for ACC. Going back to the two arguments, the post-1989 era of early childhood, we have two forces here. One is the rights of the child, and the other one is the economic argument, both supported very much from neuroscience. The child remains at the center of attention. However, there is slightly different focus in the sense that the rights of the child emphasize the responsibility of the state to support the family to observe the child's rights. The economic argument has shifted the attention of the child as becoming to contribute to the family and to society. So although the child is there, the center, there is uh, differentiation between the two. And this is quite interesting to, to think about how we operate within frameworks which really present conflicts and tensions and how we uh, manage all this. So more specifically, the rights argument. The child is the unique and potent individual, the citizen of today, we advocate for child participation, the unique and potent individual. You, we can identify it in the EYFS, for example. On the other hand, the economic argument, the child in the making, the protective citizens, it's this universal child, which I will come later. At policy level, it's a public good, early childhood provision. All children should be exposed to advocates for universal provision, and that was, as far as I understand, the initial uh, focus of Sure Start before it became targeted service for the poor, for the disadvantaged. The economic argument actually has turned early childhood provision, sees early childhood provision as an intervention. It's an economic necessity. 
cell targeted provision. In terms of practice, child participation, child-led, adhering to philosophy and to philosophy, uh, child-led and adhering to philosophy of play. Child participation, it's very much figures within EYFS. It's very much something which underpins curriculum practices, at least Scandinavian in Scandinavian countries. A colleague of mine a few years ago, she presented a paper about this, how in policy, child participation has been articulated and expected to influence practice. And she looked at policy, pedagogy, and practice. And there were the challenges. It's not so simple, because as a practitioner, you serve each and every individual child. One child's participation in one thing which interests them, it may not be the interest of another child. So how do you bring all this? But also is the child voice. We talk a lot about child voice, uh, but how do we understand child voice? Because it's not only what is articulated, voice also is what is not said. How do we conceptualize? How do we uh, access all children's voices rather than the well articulated? On the other hand, we have focus on learning outcomes, intended learning outcomes, child and adult led, children's assessment and evaluation of services. I mean, for those who are familiar with the Early Years Foundation stage, they can see actually that all these are enmeshed there and the policy makers try to uh, accommodate different views, but that presents challenges as well, especially when the focus remains on the child, on the unique, the potent individual child. So, how those two arguments have influenced international policy? So the Convention of the Rights of the Child and the Economic Arguments Frameworks became the foundation of IFA, which is Education for All Goals. So in the 1990s, we had the Jomtien uh, Convention where it was a proclamation, learning starts at birth. In 2002, it was the Dakar Framework where early childhood actually, or pre-primary education, it has become the first goal. And countries which were assigned to the conventions of the rights of the child, they had to observe this and to demonstrate that they have achieved, they have provided pre-primary education. Although it's quite interesting, the focus here is in pre-primary education rather than early childhood care and education from birth as we now talk about. So that was one international uh, commitment. So actually this diagram comes from the Education for All Global Monitoring Report 2015, which demonstrates that 47% of the countries, they have achieved that target. And there is another 8% percent of countries nearing that target and of course there are another 25 percent and 20 percent which are quite far away. So that means that 20, 25 years later it's less than 50 percent of the countries have achieved this goal. The next one, it was the Millennium Development Goals, which were introduced in 2000 with the view to achieve certain targets by 2015. And one, eradicate extreme poverty, achieve universal primary education, promote gender equity, reduce child mortality, improve maternal health, combat HIV and AIDS, uh, 
ensure environmental sustainability and also gold, uh, go global partnership. ECEC actually, if we go back to the evidence from program evaluation, it was seen as contributing directly or indirectly towards six out of the eight uh, develop uh, Millennium Development Goals. As we saw earlier, we are still far away of meeting this goal. But I think we had a success and a challenge with the Sustainable Development Goals for 2030. Early childhood care and education is specifically now mentioned within Target 4, which is about inclusive, equitable, quality education to promote the economic argument, lifelong learning and opportunities for all. Specifically about early childhood, it says by 2030 to ensure that all girls and boys have access to quality early childhood development, care and pre-primary education so that they are ready, that's the important thing, for primary school. And as an indicator to measure success, to measure success against this, against this target, uh, an initial indicator, it was measuring, assessing children's holistic development. However, a different indicator has been proposed, yet to be agreed what is going to be the final uh, uh, indicators. But another indicator has been proposed is to assess children's literacy and maths at pre-primary age or at a particular specific age group like four to five or five to six. It's more likely to be four to five. However, the, the, the difference between, we see a shift here or a focus on early literacy and pre-primary education for school readiness. We move beyond holistic development and this is the result of concerns about learning outcomes. What it has happened with education for all, more children are now in primary schools. However, the challenge is that a lot of these children drop out and they don't meet the expected learning outcomes. So they drop out, they don't meet the learning outcomes, they don't meet the learning outcomes, they find it difficult and they drop out of school. So the solution is to prepare children for primary school. And that's why this particular emphasis on literacy and maths. And in low and middle income, income countries, international and NGOs like Save the Children, a Plan International and so on, they have developed all kinds of packages about literacy and maths. I worked at Save the Children. We had first read about emerging literacy. We had the uh, ELMI, Early Literacy Math Initiative. We had uh, Literacy Boost and so on. And all this to be applied in context or to be used and implemented by practitioners and professional uh, teachers without qualification. The first read, for example, which it was about emerging literacy to be implemented in the early years. The people who work with young children, most of them, they, are ba they have basic education. They are not even graduate of secondary school. They themselves have limited literacy skills. And then we prepare packages, which we carry all our PhD knowledge, master knowledge, and we have prescriptive lessons. And does it work? Still, we have to see it. But uh, one issue which really is very important and very interesting, two years ago I had a workshop, uh, a symposium with uh, different uh, participants from UNESCO, UNICEF, Save the Children, as well as uh, commissioners of children's, high, uh, children's rights, academics. And one thing which it was raised, it was capacity building. It was professionalism. Without well-trained and educated professionals, it's very difficult to have quality education. So there is a big challenge in low and middle income countries. 
And uh, also, there is a challenge uh, even in, the, in England because we are the only European, the only country of the European Union which doesn't require yet to have practitioners or professionals educated to a degree level. I won't go through this, but the, the rights of the child was very important because in 2006 they came back and say, actually the rights apply to all children from birth and they focused very much on the age group of birth to five years old. And apart from this, that meeting was, very, it's called Common 7 to CRC, that every service which is developed, it should be planned with children's rights in mind. And then this is going to be monitored and see whether the children's rights are observed. So that needs to be practiced. Okay, so two thirds of the countries have signed all these um, agreements. Quality remains a question. We have introduced standards for ECEC for early childhood care and education, for training and qualification. We talk about multi-sectoral collaboration, financing, but also assessment, child assessment came and evaluation of quality. Now, for those who work with uh, the EYFS, they will know that's not part of the way EYFS is every child matters. The economic argument, it was explicitly stated in every child matters. We can see being healthy, staying safe, which applies to children's rights, uh, but also enjoying and achieving and economic well-being. So it tried to bring together those uh, two uh, powerful forces, the rights of the child and the socioeconomic argument. EYFS, quality, appears there, and equality for opportunity. Now, this is quite interesting. Intending the learning outcomes, we went back to very much normative development because we talk about communication and language, physical development, personal, social, emotional development, but also literacy and maths. And school readiness, actually, it's explicitly stated in the latest EYFS. I will skip this one. I will go to the assessment. So each child should be assessed when they reach age five. And this assessment record should be shared with parents and also passed on to the primary school. What is quite important is When we assess the children, we take very much a child development, like we assess the child out of the context. It's like all children experience the same context. All children come with the same uh, social educational capital. All children come with the same linguistic uh, competences. And that's not true even within one country, never mind when we take this into other countries and I have experienced this myself. So we go and assess children using ages and stages and tools which are alien to them. It's very difficult. How do you assess a children's literacy in a paperless society, which is our aspiration, as far as I understand, in the technology era, but it's not in Rwanda, when paper is at premium, where pen is not there, when children practice writing on the dirt with their fingers, and then we go and assess whether they are able to hold the pen. So there is some kind of intellectual imperialism here. We developed all this and we go there and we say, oh yes, of course, you can contextualize and so on. And usually this is what we are doing without having a clue of the context. And it's very uh, challenging. So just I mentioned here, ages and stages, widely used, translated in uh, 
I don't know, 30 different languages, early grade math assessment, literacy assessment. Also, we've got environmental rating scales. And that's also interesting because I've used MELCO, the Monitoring Evaluation Learning Quality uh, Tool, in Tanzania. Well, it says the floor is clean. Well, there were early childhood settings without a building under the tree. It says having uh, hand washing facilities, and they've realized it was dry season. People traveled the whole day to gather water. And whether there is hand washing facilities. So this is where the policy and the instruments which we use as a result of policy to demonstrate impact and justify the investment, they really have the conception of this universal child. Is the biological child, is the child as a result of the genetic endowment. Like context, culture, conditions don't matter. And it's very important that we are mindful of this. And it's important also to remember this, because it's quite easy to say policymakers are doing a bad job. Uh, perhaps they do as well, because there is intentionality in policy. That policy really looks at the totality of children, looks and tries to improve the average population to a certain level. Remember about league tables in schools, 70% of children should have reached literacy at this level or 95% and so on. It's the totality of the children. It's not about the individual child, but the individual child, this unique, the potent, the capable child is the focus of the practitioner, okay? And this is where pedagogical practice should ensure that each and every child develops their capabilities, they reach their potential to enable them to maintain their individuality. We need to ensure that children are able to do things, to count up to 10, as the assessment tests require, but also to be, but also to belong in this place. I've seen children uh, in Rwanda well, the first time when I visited the early year settings, they were with seeds and sticks, and they were doing a very good job because they were familiar with these tools. The next visit a year later, the early year centers were equipped with all the westernized materials. Where these materials were? In the primary school, to be kept safe, on selves without using, for many different reasons. One, the, the adults, the practitioners themselves, they were not familiar with this. They didn't know how to use them. They couldn't see the relevance. Secondly, they were so expensive to replace. It was something which they couldn't imagine, so they had them for safe keep. So let provide Early years, early years services which are appropriate and relevant to the context and also allow the communities to make a judgment about the impact because communities do know about the impact. When I went to uh, Rwanda and I did the mid-term review of the project at the time when they used the sticks and seeds and stones and so on, they, the parents were very clear they said, it changed our life, our interaction with the children. Suddenly we've realized that our children can think, can talk, ask questions. They engage us in conversations. They do better than the children who are now in the primary school and they didn't attend uh, early years uh, centers. The teachers, the teachers said, well, it was quite interesting. Now we've spent a lot of time to familiarize children with the school process. The children come from the early year centers. They know the culture, they engage, 
they differentiate things, they can see differences. I introduce a new letter. Children who were at the early year setting say, oh, this is a new one. We haven't been taught about this, whereas the other children couldn't even see the difference. It was chaos. So it was, and they've said, actually, it made us work harder <laughs> because we can't keep them uh, behind. So it changes their practice as well and raises issues about school readiness. It's not just the child being ready. It's the family gets ready for school, the school becomes ready for, for the child. Okay, so uh, pedagogy is not just the act of teaching. It's not transmission of knowledge and skills. Pedagogy is all about these processes involved in decision making. We have to make judgments. What do we know? We take into account the extent knowledge. What is the environment? What are the circumstances? What are the conditions? And of course, we have to examine our personal values, beliefs, biases, and prejudice as well. So, pedagogy requires that we take an ethical stance. And as I was trying to formulate my thinking, I do always remember, and I do like it actually, the Aristotelian principle of pan metron ariston, which if we try to translate it, uh, it may be translated as the balance or the average is the best. However, this is not correct. Pan metron ariston is making decision in terms of knowledge and in terms of context and circumstances. So what do you decide for one child? It may not be the same for another child because even the same knowledge may not be applicable even if the circumstances are the same. So that means, however, we're doing what we ought to be done. In Greek is toprepon. And what is possible to be done? This is todinaton. So what is ought to be done, perhaps as practitioners, you have the EYFS, which articulates that this is the best practice. You have the school policies or the early year setting policy, which says this is how we deal with these circumstances. Okay? And you follow this. And this is to prep on. You abide to regulations, to the law. What is possible is something different. Under these circumstances, what else can I do? What is the best for, for, for the child? And this is very important. But there is also a challenge between to prep on and to dinner on what it ought to be done and what is possible to be done. It's not straightforward, and the two, they don't compromise. Because very often we can say, what is possible is outside of our regulations. And that requires personal responsibility. Do we still hold any personal responsibility? Anyway, but the thinking about to prep on to what is ought to be done and what is possible to be done, it brought me to the idea of being just and being fair. Being just, you operate within a framework, within particular uh, regulations, but being fair is the, the circumstances are taken into account. Very often, uh, just and fair, they use as synonymous, but they are slightly different. Actually, not different, they are slightly, they are completely different. So justice and fairness are two components for equity. I was looking into this, I was trying to, to, to define and clarify those two uh, concepts, and suddenly it hit me. Equity is an important aspect because we talk about quality and equality, but we don't talk about equity. And equity is the principle of differential input depending on the circumstances. 
being fair, but we can't ignore the issue that we need to be just as well. So that means that being just and fair in pedagogical practice is to treat equitably each and every child. That means that we need to strive that each and every child receive equitable differential input depending on it to achieve equality as an outcome for all children. So equality, we don't start from the equality. Very often we talk equal opportunities, like everyone starts from the same basis. We don't start from the same basis. And because we don't start from the same basis, we need equitable provision. In order to achieve equality as an outcome, and because to apply standardized pedagogy or good practices is to ignore diversity. And diversity is today's norm across the globe, and it's crucial that we consider this in our pedagogy so that each and every individual child thrives within early childhood care and education institutions whilst he or she is empowered to become the productive ad adult of tomorrow. So equity, justice, uh, fairness, justice, equitable provision, and equity, uh, equality are some of the concepts and ideas which perhaps need refining and articulating better, and this is where I need your help. Thank you. Brilliant. Thank you so much, Theodora. We very much appreciate um, your presentation there. There's loads of food, food for thought within what you've said. Um, we've unfortunately run out of time, but we meet as the Early Childhood team every Friday lunchtime. So if you're interested in unpacking some of the things that Theodora has been saying, we'll make this the focus of our discussion this Friday. We meet in the senior common room in HCA and you'd all be very welcome. Bring your lunch with you. We won't have lunch for you, but please do bring your lunch um, and come and join us in terms of discussing all of the content um, because this has been very rich in content and there's lots of food for thought um, that we'll be discussing this Friday. So hopefully we'll see you there. Thank you so much for your time. We appreciate you coming. Can we say thank you to Theodora one more time? Thank you. If you're from here but, from Sala and you haven't signed in, I think you need to sign this piece of paper. That would be great. But I am here for any urgent questions or information.